founder and CEO of Real Estate Business Analytics, here for another episode of The People Behind the Performance, where I sit down with key leaders and disruptors to dive into what's driving the real estate industry's success, the role data plays in it all, and tell the stories of the people behind it. I'm here to get today with guest Mike Brewer, who is Chief Operating Officer at the Radco Companies and a good friend and colleague. Mike is passionate about people, technology, and real estate. His investments in, te in technological advances and education improve his team members' experience and elevates customer engagement. He joined Radco Residential in 2016 and oversees all operations. Mike has received numerous industry honors, including seven Property Management Company of the Year awards under his leadership, an avid reader and lifelong learner, as you can tell from that bookcase <laughs> behind Mike has been, quote unquote, out to put a dent in the multifamily universe for more than 25 years. Examples of that effort are his frequent contributions to industry-related publications and his blog, The Multifamily Collective, that reaches industry professionals across the globe who tune in daily for Mike's reflections. So now I get to turn the tables on Mike and put him in the hot seat. Welcome, Mike. Let's go ahead and get started. So as you think about the state of the industry today, what's on your mind? Oh, wow. What's not on my mind? There you go. <laughs> Good open-ended question to start the ball rolling. Gosh. Yeah, let's get really broad really fast. Um, so I, I think I think the chief things are obviously things that had COVID as a predicate. Um, mm -hmm. So I think things like the great resignation uh, come to mind, certainly staffing in our industry. Uh, certainly what, what I described one time is the this tsunami of prop tech that's making landfall in the multifamily space that uh, mm -hmm. certainly is, is front and center. I think I, I said that a couple of years ago, but I think that is giving way to um, some technologies that have actually kind of prove their use cases and, and are actually making an impact in, in the industry. Um, and I think uh, I think the service side of our business, meaning maintenance, I call it service, but maintenance side of our business is something that I, I think about constantly. I think I probably thought about that for 10 years, plus or minus, just mm -hmm. because I think that's a, it's an underserved part of our industry. Um, and it, it just, it weighs on my mind a lot. So let's, yeah. Start there. So what 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 are you what are you most excited about? Wow, what I'm most excited about. I I I truly believe that technology, I mean, not to plug your technology, but I think technology uh, applications like the one you're working on with Reba is certainly excited. Donald didn't pay me to say that. <laughs> I think that I think that the way that let's call it the youth in our society, the youth in our business are thinking about the multifamily space. Uh, and sort of revolutionizing what we do. Uh, I get excited about when I read about properties that actually, multifamily properties that are actually operating with no team members on site. Mm -hmm. That's pretty exciting. And not that I want people to be put out of jobs, but I certainly think that uh, things like that are exciting. I think centralized leasing is exciting. I think centralized uh, operations that are germane to the assistant manager, although people have been working on that for 15 or 15 years plus minus, uh, that that's pretty exciting to me, but there's a lot going on in the industry yeah. that's that's really exciting. Well, that's that's a lot to juggle. So, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> oh, I well, I think the thing that keeps me up at night is that Radco Residential. So, it, at peak, we were 83 properties, some 30, close to 35,000 units, and and probably because of most of our investment plans, uh, sort of running their course three to five year holds or five to seven year holds, we we kind of started selling as the pandemic set in. And then after people got their bearings and, and things were repriced, uh, we we sold a lot. Um, and so now we, we got down to like 2000 units. We're back to around 5000 units. So the thing that keeps me up at night is growing the business back to some level of mass that, that keeps everybody that we we have working for us today, uh, employed, mm -hmm. fruitful. So I think yeah. about that a lot. I think I think a couple, a couple of years from now, when you guys have uh, at least partway through that regrowth model, I, I feel like there's an NMHC session or an NAA session in this whole arc of from 30 to two and back to 20 or something like that. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's you know, mo most people only experience one or two of those in their entire, one or two sizes in their entire career. You're experiencing that whole arc in just a few years. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I, I, I do believe that. I'm, I'm certainly probably an overly optimistic person, but our goal is really to get to 25,000 units by 2025, and we want to be at 10,000 units by the end of this year. But but let me put an asterisk by that, because it's really not about the number of units. Mm -hmm. 
it's really about creating a culture that is enriching to the team mm -hmm. members uh, that are going to be a part of growing that organization. So if, if we miss yeah. 10,000, but we've created a culture that certainly we want to be profitable, but if we've created a culture that really enriches people's lives, that's really more important mm -hmm. to us than, than hitting a number. Yeah, and you've, you've always been very people oriented. So that that's a great segue maybe into a couple of questions on your personal background. So everybody always has an interesting story, how they get into this industry. Um, you know, many of us, myself included, kind of just hit the fly trap paper that is multifamily uh, coming at it from outside. <laughs> so what what's your story? Did you get stuck in the fly trap or did you intentionally start multifamily? How, how did you get going? Yeah, so I'll try. I'll try to give you the thumbnail sketch of this. And and since it is, I think it's Mental Health Awareness Month. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and certainly, I don't mind disclosing this. But I, so I went to college on a full ride scholarship. I went to Texas Tech University, full ride basketball scholarship. Uh, two years into that experience, going into my third year, I fell into a very deep depression, um, and and went into isolation. Uh, and really hold up as a person and ended up leaving school to go back to the little hometown that I was from and uh, try to to reset my bearings, if you will. And and when I did that, I didn't I didn't really have an aim in life. And I ran into a gentleman who worked for Remax Town and Country, uh, the single family home sales that they're a behemoth. Mm -hmm. But right. uh, I ran into a guy who owned the franchise in, in the little town that I lived in. And uh, he basically took me under his wing and taught me the real estate business and not so much from the single family sales angle, but actually investing in real estate. Mm. So he sold me my first little uh, duplex and then oh. later on an eightplex. And then I started buying single family homes. And so that's how I got introduced to real estate. Then I met a girl and I gave all that real estate to my parents to manage as a third job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, and I moved back and, and re-enrolled in college and <laughs> worked as a as a leasing consultant uh, in uh, for a firm in Lubbock, Texas, and then ultimately ended up in Seattle working for equity residential properties, and then made my way to St. Louis, Missouri, working for a, a family-owned firm called Mills Properties before landing here in Atlanta for uh, going to work for Radco. Well, what a, what a wonderful story, also for <laughs> you know those of us who have I have kids now just out of college, but uh, the trials and travails of college. Uh, there really is a life after college, isn't there? That's yes, true statement. Very true statement. <laughs> so you you mentioned the the person who took you under his wing. It, was, was he your most influential professional mentor, or was there one more in the multifamily space you'd like to share? Yeah, I'd I'd say by far and away he, yeah, and he's still a mentor to this day. Uh, cool. I can call him up from time to time, but but I also I mean certainly the gentleman that I work for today, Norman Radow, is a tremendous mm -hmm. mentor in, in my life and. And I'd give a lot of kudos to Kirk Mills, who uh, who owns and runs uh, Mills Properties in St. Louis, has been a huge influence in my in my family life. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, what? Um, it's a question I always like to ask everybody. What is one thing that you know about the industry today that you wish you could go back and teach the Mike Brewer back, however many years ago when you first came in the industry, because you didn't know it then, but you know it now, and you'd love to teach that that version of Mike Brewer that long ago, something you know now. Yeah, I, I would tell you that it, it readily comes to mind and that is the the value of time and exposure and what I call doing the reps, right? So mm -hmm. so just like I think many, many of the youth in our industry today, I was no different 20, 25 years ago. I wanted to be the president of the company tomorrow and I didn't realize that uh, going through the reps of time. In other words, seeing a lot mm -hmm. of different scenarios in your real estate career. Yeah. The good, the bad, the ugly, the business cycles, all of those things are germane to helping you get uh, when you do finally arrive uh, at that moment where you get to take on additional responsibility or you're you're promoted into a position of, of RM or VP or senior vice president or even uh, the COO of a company you can't do it without having seen all those things that you need to see along the way and experiencing all those adversities along the way. And the one piece of advice that I'd get to anybody back then that I know now is go for the tough stuff. Mm -hmm. Don't, uh, there's a lot of sexy stuff out there, a lot of sexy real estate that you can go to work on. And certainly those sexy real estate deals provide opportunities to learn, but I'll tell you where mm -hmm. you learn the most. That's go dive into those BC class assets 
yeah. and understand the human, di human dynamic behind those, both from the customer side of the business and the team member side of the business. <clears throat> that'll really accelerate the path of your career. Get, yeah, get gonna, in the I'm, tough stuff. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take away that. That I think I'm gonna use that quote. Uh, do the reps. Is that, uh, is, is that, is that coming from your athlete background or uh, just? Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. I that goes that dates back to high school. So my high school basketball coach used to say, uh, "Perfect practice makes perfect," and you have to do the reps. He he always ended by saying, "You have to do the reps." Yeah, no, that's cool. <laughs> so, um, what's a uh, what's a challenge that Ratko's facing right now, and what are you doing to overcome it? it the biggest challenge is growing our our unit counts again, right? And certainly threading the needle in terms of putting the right right amount of team members in place in terms of the infrastructure in order to be ahead of the growth. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly you don't want to invest too soon, but you don't want to invest too late. And so we've hired as of late a talent uh, coordinator, uh, somebody that will actually help us uh, thread that needle, not only from a sourcing aspect, from, but from a strategic aspect. Uh, we have a business development person that we put on our team about a year ago. And so I think just just uh, keeping people excited about the horizon is probably the mm -hmm. biggest challenge that we face today. And the biggest thing that we're doing is over communicating through daily huddle meetings, weekly meetings, monthly meetings. We have town hall meetings. We have an internal television show that we call The Brew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's not <laughs> it's not a vanity project, but but we're overly communicating the vision. We're being open kimono as i like to say it's completely transparent we we share our financials with all of our team members across the organization and just because i think uh you have to give people all the information so they can make informed decisions and feel a part of the process yeah. so it, i mean with the rapid growth you're trying to do i mean everybody talks today about how hard it is um to recruit right you know the great resignation although i'm always amused the great resignation that also means that if there are millions of people leaving jobs, that means there's millions of people going to new jobs. But you know, I know as a startup, you know ourselves trying to recruit, it uh, it's almost like buying a house. If you don't jump quickly, they take another job before you even finish the interview process. So I'm I'm curious how you're wrestling with that because you have to hire on an even greater scale um, th than a technology company like like Reba. Yeah, we we wrestled with this, really grappled with it, and. Where, where we landed was we had to go back and revisit our compensation strategy, our overarching compensation strategy. So we looked at the entire thing. We completely rebuilt it based on, she was probably four different uh, industry surveys, some of them multifamily specific, others that are, that are more broad mm -hmm. in reach, but uh, completely revamped that, uh, thought through it from every single position in our organization. Uh, and then we coupled that up with, we were already working on a culture that was team member first, but not just saying team member first, but really living out a team member first culture. Mm -hmm. So we married together this new compensation structure with a continued effort on our team member first uh, culture initiatives. And I think what we haven't experienced is beyond the norm turnover percentages mm -hmm. in, in the multifamily space. Not that we were beating anybody by any stretch of the imagination, but but we mm -hmm. didn't have any severe dips on the downside. So the back door was closed to some extent, as they say, mm -hmm. and uh, and we've been able to attract based on our compensation structure, our new compensation structure, mm -hmm. and certainly the culture that we have, we have created. So it, it, it's interesting to me, the language you used around, you know, people centric first, really meaning it, not just saying it, because yep. you and I both know a lot of people talk the talk on that, but don't necessarily walk the walk. So. Maybe share with our viewers one or two specific examples of how Radco as a company and maybe you personally as a COO are actually walking that talk. Yeah, so the thing I, so I'll use just the disclosure of, of my own mental health issues as, as an example. And I, I like to say that, I like to say that people, when people come to work for you and they cross over the threshold, whether it be walking into a business office at the site level or walking into a corporate office, there's not a code, a code hook hanging outside the threshold where you but, throw your problems on it and you come in, right? That's just not reality. So creating psychologically safe spaces at mm -hmm. Radco where you can bring your whole self to work. And if you're struggling with something, it doesn't matter what the the genesis is of that struggle, be it a mental health issue or you just had a bad morning getting out the door. Yeah. You, you have a space to 
to talk about that. And if it's really impacting you, you know, on a human basis that day, look, take the day off. Go and by the way, I'm going to pay you. Just go home, gather yourself. Uh, if if we can help in any way, shape, and form, look, we're not psychologists, we're not psychiatrists, so we can't get too deep into that. Right. But I think at least providing a safe space where you can at least disclose and then you can take an action. That's something that we really endorse. I think if nothing else, just uh, they can see your smile because you've always had such an infectious <laughs> smile. In fact, I love I love your bio photo because um, most people, when they smile like that, it somehow just looks uh, cheesy. It's it's very authentic um, in your case. So oh, well, it's probably you. making you feel awkward now. Yeah, uh, definitely. What the heck? <laughs> what the heck? Um, so. Uh, I guess one last question on the, the industry in general, um, you know, is there something you were talking a lot about technology? Is there a particular disruptor in the industry that you kind of got your eye on or something you think is is going to change the game more than uh, more than anything else? You know, I won't go so far to say is to say that I think this is a game changer, but I, I can tell you it's made a real impact on me. And I, I'm not going to talk about companies specifically, but I'll, I'll talk about it thematically. So okay. I think there's this interesting dynamic. And I, I don't know that this is novel. It, it's novel to me, so I won't go so far as to say it's novel to everybody. But, but there are some interesting technologies that have come along that have included the customer in the, the rev share equation, mm -hmm. right? So if, if I'm just going to make one up, and please know that this is not a tell for a company. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But there, Maybe it's a good idea for a new guy to uh, start this, but go ahead. Yeah, so a, a parking, let's say a parking garage, right? And if you think about a parking space that may set vacant for eight to 10 hours a day because someone leaves the building to go to work, yeah. and that space is available for another parker, especially in an urban setting, right? And so mm -hmm. a technology that comes along that catalogs all your parking spaces, but gives control to the consumer who pays for that space, but gives them the opportunity to lease that space out during that eight to 10 hours, share in the rev, the property owner shares in the rev, and certainly the platform provider shares right. in the rev. I, I've seen no less than three of those now, not, not uh -huh. parking related, but three of those technologies yeah. that are thinking about the customer in that respect. <clears throat> that is fascinating because I, I may offend a lot of people when I say this, but one of the things I've always told people in this industry is it's mostly run by deal guys. And every time um, I think of a deal guy, I think of sort of the philosophy of what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine, right? It's almost <laughs> like, uh, you know, finding an emo, the seagulls, right? Mine, 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 mine. That's right. And and I think, you know, and, and, and in, I mean, in fairness, if, if you're doing deals all the time, you know, there is a, you know, as much as we love everything to be win-win when it comes to signing a contract for a sale, it is win lose, right? If I can get a dollar more from you, I win, you lose, vice versa. Right. So I understand that. I don't mean it quite as pejoratively as it probably comes across, <laughs> but it's important to understand the, the industry being built that way. So I, I do think it's fascinating. Like you said, I, I don't know that it's going to be a game changer um, economically. Like you know, suddenly you're going to make ten times as much money. It's it's ancillary. It's called ancillary no. for a reason. But I do wonder as I listen to you talk about that whether culturally it'll really change the industry because the, the customer is no longer just the person we get money from, right? We, we actually give some, something back to them through the platform that, that we enable. That's fascinating. to me. Yeah, I think it's akin to, I'll make one last remark about this and then there is a game changer that I would talk about, but I think mm -hmm. it is akin, it is akin to a loyalty program, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a, or at least the, the models that I've seen so far have been akin to a loyalty program it's stamp the coffee card, you know, 10 right. times you get a free cup of coffee sort of thing. And so in my head, there's a little bit of a gamification to it. And there's a little bit of a sticky, yeah. a sticky hindsight to it, right? Your customer seems a little more loyal, or at least I'm, this is the story I'm telling myself. This customer might right. be a little more loyal to you uh, because now well, you've shared some well, economics with them. Or, or even enabled. I mean, I, I, you know, I did a, I did a white paper. What you're talking about reminds me, I did a white paper for Pillow Homes back when they existed. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and one of the stories in there, while, while most of Denver operators, owners, were against allowing their residents to sublet out through, yeah. through Pillow, through Airbnb, anything like that, um, I actually interviewed a community manager who told me about a pair of Southwest flight attendants who could not afford the $4,000 a month rent. But because they traveled so much, 
Yep. Now you see where it's going. And this property was using pillow. They subleased out when they were on the road and could afford a home they couldn't otherwise afford. And so the revenue and man the revenue manager and me went expand the demand, right? If I can expand the demand for a given supply, I can actually make more money on it. And um, you know, not that it alone would solve the country's affordability problems, of course, but it is interesting if you leverage that unused um, asset to the benefit of the consumer, not just the operator, it, it could be a small contributor to, to the housing affordability equation. I, so I 100% agree, 100% agree. I, I, so what, I'll just, I'll make this one super brief. The, the game changer I think is coming in the way of IOT and, and sensors, yep. um, I think leak detection. I think if you, this would be a real game changer if somebody can come along and figure out how to get insurance companies interesting mm. in helping install the infrastructure, uh, yeah, certainly yeah. across certainly across existing inventory, uh, because mm. I think in a new build, you could probably install this on the front side. Yeah. But I think it's in an insurance company's interest to put leak detection in or to assist yeah. in putting leak detection in. Um, certainly anything fire related. I've, I've seen some super interesting sensor technology the one that I get most excited about is self-diagnosing appliances. You know, mm -hmm. so if if a stove or a refrigerator or dishwasher is pulling more amperage than it normally would, sure, you know, yeah. because you have these sort of variances yeah. in draw, it it'll call the technician with no human involved. Right. I think that's right. pretty exciting. No, I mean anything that makes it you know more hassle-free <clears throat> for the resident and much better to proactively fix that stove than deal with a angry resident whose stove is now not working. So yeah, yeah um, I totally get it. Totally get that. Well, let's turn in the in the uh, next to last section of, of our uh, discussion today. Let's just turn a little bit to obviously what's near and dear to real estate business analytics, and that's data. So um, what does data driven decision making mean to you? That term gets thrown around a lot. <laughs> sure. I, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this. I think uh, I think so. I describe it like this. Uh, there's almost too much data, right? In I mean, it's not that there's too much data. It's that those who attempt to get beyond the eight to 10 drivers that really fundamentally mm -hmm. move our business, I describe it like, look, the flow of water on a Tuesday afternoon in Tulsa, Oklahoma on a property in a one bedroom apartment who houses one person, I don't know that that type of value has yeah. is valuable, right? But, but I do believe there are eight to 10 drivers that in form decisions mm -hmm. that can actually move the business forward. And I yeah. think to the, atten the, to the extent that a system can curate that data and make it actionable and or prescriptive in nature, yeah. that, that becomes hugely valuable, valuable to a, a person who's moving the business on the ground. No, that, that resonates uh, with me. I, I see many instances are in our industry of people being a little too clever by half, trying to do too much. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I, I would also add, I'm curious your reaction to this. I would add one of the benefits of a really good BI platform, and I certainly saw this in my days at Archstone, is, you know, as a COO, right, in your perch, especially when you were at 30,000 units, when you get to 20, again, you can't possibly pay attention to everything. Oh, no. And so, you know, there, while there's, while there's a limit to the eight to 10 at your level, I do think at a community level, there's a couple of things more granular that a community manager has time to pay attention to, but only if it's easily pointed out to her, right? right? We, we, don't, right. we don't have detectives as community managers. They're service oriented, dealing with staff, dealing with residents. If you give them something that shows them a little thing they can improve on, that little thing over hundred properties is suddenly big. Yes. But if you don't show it to them in a way that's obvious, they're not gonna go into an Excel sheet the way an analyst or the way you and I early in our careers may have gone gone after it. That's that's not who they are. That's not how they're wired. It's not why we hired them. That's right. That's exactly right. I think that brings that brings up a point that <laughs> I think I think business models are going to uh, evolve, right? So higher mm -hmm. call if a hierarchy gives way to a, sort of a sociocracy or something of that nature that you use to run the business, I think I think you're going to start to hire people who are more pointy in their skill set mm -hmm. and you know, a, somebody in the office who's really good at leasing is just going to lease apartments. They're not going to do paperwork anymore. But right. I, th I think the same point applies to what you're what you're implying mm -hmm. there. It put people in seats doing the stuff that they're really good at and, yeah. and take that well, other what, stuff out there. 
what I'm passionate about is, I mean, 95 out of 100 people we hire want to do a good job. And the other five will figure out and get rid of them, right? That's right. That's right. The, the 95 that want to do a good job, it, it doesn't mean that they're analysts to figure out what it takes to do a good job. That's right. Right. So, I mean, that's right. why there are standard operating procedures. That's why there's handbooks, et cetera. And, and so I, I just, again, I'm, I get, I kind of get geeked up on this. I'm just passionate about how can we visually show something to somebody that makes it obvious that they need to do something, right? Even something as esoteric as, you know, don't show me the pet rent, don't show them the pet rent number in the P&L, show them the pet rent number per home with pets. And then right. if, I'm, if I'm charging $25 a month for pet rent and my pet rent per home for pets is $17, Guess what? I've got almost 50% growth in pet rent just by enforcing it. And that's not me being an idiot. I mean, that's not me, me being an ass about it. That's actually me being fair. If this guy's paying 25 bucks for his pet, then she ought to be paying 25 for hers, right? Everybody should be the same. So if you make it obvious what action to take, that to me is the essence of a true key performance. And we throw around the term key performance indicator left and right. A that's real right. key performance indicator makes it obvious what action to take. And that's, right. and that's, you know, that's what good BI does. So fascinating. So how do you go about championing? I mean, data is obviously real important to you. How do you go about championing a data culture? Well, so, so we, we bake that into our, uh, I'm going to call it our operating architecture mm -hmm. <laughs> or our operating system in, internal to Radco. And it's really predicated on every meeting that we get into. Let's use our Monday meeting as an example. Mm -hmm. um, our Monday morning meeting is driven by data. Let's use Kingsley as an example. That happens to be mm -hmm. the, the customer survey. So every single Monday we sit in a room and the customer has a seat at the table. We pull up our Kingsley data, mm -hmm. not only our metrics, but also the narrative, right? right? And we read through all of that and then we see if there are any themes that we need to respond to or any deficits mm -hmm. or even look, use data to celebrate too, right? Yep. So what are we going to celebrate this week? What do we need to work on this week? And what is this narrative telling us? And so we do that for Kingsley. We work with mm -hmm. Swift Bunny. So we do it from a team member experience standpoint. We also do it with a business partner. We, we actually have business partner surveys, mm -hmm. which seems kind of weird, but we use that data to, to inform our decisions as it relates to how, you know, how fast is our AP working? How, is it not working well? Is it working well? Is, it, is, mm -hmm. it, uh, is there room for improvement? So we pull all that data into a Monday morning meeting, and that happens all throughout our organization. So not only are we talking about it from a senior level, but our regional managers are talking about that, mm -hmm. our party managers are talking about it, but it's all, all of our meetings are data driven. Got it. No, that, uh, that, that's a great, that's a great way. I mean, you have to, you have to practice what you preach, not just preach it. Um, so this industry is not exactly known for making it easy to collect and share data. Um, what, what do you see as sort of the biggest threat to data out there? What, what gets in your way? What do you, wish was different. Oh, wow. Am I really allowed to say that here? <laughs> yes. I'll even let you name names. It, oh, oh, here's man. the thing, Mike, I am not a popular person. Nobody is watching this other than my wife and our and our associates at, at Reba. So you can say anything. So, so listen, I, I had the, <laughs> I had the, the founder and owner of, of Yardi come visit me one time in Atlanta because I have really railed against uh, Yardi. Mm -hmm. For a very long bit of time, I've written blog posts about it. And, and my chief frustration is that the pay to play models, what, what is my data is very hard to get out of the system that I pay you to put in place to help me govern the property. And it, it's just painful to get data out in a way that is usable for what I consider best in breed applications that I would love to use, but I find all the flaws in them because. Mm -hmm. The backside data can't get to that that system in a way that it makes it makes it useful. So I I just find that very frustrating. I don't know how to fix it. I've been railing about it forever. I'm not the only person that rails about it. <laughs> yeah, I do. It's interesting. I do think the the industry naively made a mistake in the early aughts when they went into um, you know the current contemporary property management systems, signing agreements that they didn't even realize what they were signing away. Yeah. Um, and I mean certainly. You know, we benefit from an ecosystem where data flows like water. Um, you know, I don't know. I think data maybe flows like mud in our industry. It does flow, but That's not right. quite like water. So uh, who knows? Maybe maybe you and a few of your colleagues will 
rally in and, uh, and over time things will change. I mean, it actually in, in defense of of Yardy and Rumpage and others, um, it is easier to get data now than it was ten years ago. I believe and that. I expect and I expect it will be easier ten years from now. Um, personally, I'd love to see it happen in ten months, not ten years. I'm sure you would as well. Um, well, thank you for being so candid with that. Well, let's just close this out with a little bit of fun, okay? Okay. So just um, just a little rapid fire sort of James Lipton style Q and A. Don't think too much on this. It's really not that important, okay? Um, <laughs> what book has influenced you the most? As a man thinketh in the Bible, both of those. What is your favorite time of day? Oh, morning time by far. Why? You're so sure of it. <laughs> I just, I love being up before there is any noise in the world. So I get up at five o'clock every day. I have a religious yep. routine that I go through, but I, I just love getting the day set. Excellent. What's your favorite app? Oh, I like Be Real right now. Oh, I'm not familiar with that one. Be Real. It prompts you to take a picture at random times throughout the day and you have to pick a, to take a picture of whatever's in front of you at the same time the app is taking a picture of you so it's like be huh. real <laughs> <laughs> cool what's your biggest pet peeve oh not being on time what is your spirit animal oh wow uh capybara wow i actually know what one is but that is amusing <laughs> um uh last two if you had to pick one food to eat forever what would you eat one food to eat forever? One food forever. You're not allowed to eat anything else. Oh, wow. That's uh, so unfair. So mean. I am, I'm a meat eater, so steak would be my <laughs> There you go. And lastly, what's your, uh, what's your go-to for having a good laugh? Go-to for having a good laugh. I, I'm not a fun person. And, and uh, go-to for a good laugh. I... <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I don't okay. watch silly movies. I don't do, I just don't. I, I'd rather be in a deep philosophical sort of mindset most all of the time. Well, I was going to say, judging from the philosophical questions you and I have had in the past, there's enough laughs there that maybe that is your go-to for a good laugh. That, that, might, that might be. I love stoic philosophy, and anytime I see people who are acting outside of stoic, stoic philosophy, I see humor in it, I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I'm, I'm not quite a stoic, although I have said, Show me somebody who's smiling all the time, and I'll show you somebody who's not paying attention. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the bad comes with the good. It doesn't mean, you know, can't, ha can't have happiness without sorrow, um, all those other philosophical things. Well, Mike, it's just been a pleasure having this conversation with you. Um, thank you so much for making yourself available. And uh, as we close this out, um, you know, I always like to give people a chance, uh, you know, tell us uh, a little bit or, you know, where can anyone who's listening find out about you and maybe even more importantly about the Radco companies, uh, you know, want to want to give them a chance to know what you're doing. Yeah, definitely. So I, I think the, the biggest place to find me is uh, I, I run a thing called the Multifamily Collective. Donald's been on. We've interviewed Donald yeah. on the Multifamily Collective. We do a daily daily video post, uh, really coaching and and mentoring and that kind of thing. You can see that on YouTube. I'm on all all the social channels under Multifamily Collective and or M mm -hmm. Brewer at Radco. If you wanted to email me? It's M Brewer at Radco. Dot us. Uh, I'm. I talk to people all the time, and I love to interact with uh, and, anybody. And actively looking for new free clients. So, uh, I'm Brewer at Radco. That is absolutely the place to go. Well, thanks again, Mike. I really appreciate it, and uh, look forward to watching Radco grow back to its former size. Thanks. Yep. Thank you, and uh, thank you for having me.